All right, thank you, Patrick. I uh, love those songs. Uh, in particular, Be Thou My Vision is one of my favorite uh, hymns of all time. I'm going to start with a word of prayer before I dive into my message. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for the amazing grace that you provided each one of us. I ask for your Holy Spirit's presence during this chapel that uh, the words I share would be an encouragement to the body. We pray these things in your holy precious name. Amen. Running to stand still. It's a curious phrase and one that's been in my head. It's also the title to a song by the band U2. The lead singer of U2, Bono, shares that his brother used it as an expression to capture his financial woes with running a failing business. Running to stand still. Many restaurants and business, businesses today find themselves in a similar challenge. Bono turned the phrase into the hopeless pursuit of a drug addict injecting heroin, looking for something that they thought would bring them happiness. It's also a clear allusion to giving in to the temptation of sin. One of my favorite lines from the song utters this, sweet the sin, bitter the taste in my mouth. I think the phrase running to stand still captures us in this pandemic quite aptly. It's applicable to the times in our life, our lives, when we are facing such overwhelming circumstances and we feel like we can barely keep up. You are running to stand still. We need the supply runs to continue from truckers. We need hospitals ready with equipped doctors and nurses. And the rest of us need to run to our houses to stand still. I thank one of my buddies from my high school days last week for being a trucker and making sure we have the essentials. I told him I was praying for him. He responded he never thought his job would make him a hero. He's just running trucks so we can stand still. As students and professors, we're trying our best to finish the semester. We too are running to stand still. None of us ever imagined we'd be in the story we all find ourselves in today. But everyone loves stories. I'm guessing you're probably watching a few more than you normally do as well, like I am. Whether we read them in a book, hear a good tale, sitting around a fire, watch things like Netflix or a movie displayed on the silver screen. Why do we love these stories? I think because we find ourselves in them. We often can relate to the main character or hero of the story, and we love seeing heroes face hard times and overcome them. Some of us love comedies and love laughing out loud. Others of us love a good tearjerker. We love the drama of it all. Many of the guys and some of the women in this chapel today love action or adventure flicks. We love our hearts pumping. We even love the jump scare. We're similarly excited by watching sports. Remember when we had hockey? Sorry, maybe that's too soon. Even the violence is a part of the action and intensity of an adventure story unfolding. And we're drawn to it much in the same way that we're drawn to see an accident taking place. We can't look away, we're engaged by it, mesmerized. Movies, music, sports, games, all help us run away from our problems, running to stand still. Uh, this past semester, I've been teaching a course called Pop Culture. Uh, each year, these students end up finding God in strange places, in strange stories, even in a Netflix series called Stranger Things. Through spidery cracks, the rays of sun light up the darkness. God shows up whether it was intended by the writers of the story or not. Ironically, it's typically when we've given up that the rescue happens. Sometimes God shows up in pop culture through scripture verses uttered at a graveside in a movie or TV show. But most often, we see his presence in pop culture by writers exploring gospel ideas such as sacrifice, hope, loss, love, grace, and mercy. The story of God is so grand that it infiltrates every story, really. Is there any other story than the story we find ourselves in? And here's the thing, you can't hide from God. You can't even really run from him as the prodigal son tried. He will not only wait for you, he will be looking for you. He will find you and he will embrace you. Running to stand still. 
The Hound of Heaven by poet Francis Thompson captured this idea in a poem in 1893. The speaker in the poem is running from God, as so many do, but God pursues him like a hound. Here's some lines from the, play, from the uh, poem. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. I won't read you all 182 lines, but it's a powerful poem. In fact, both Tolkien and Chesterton called it one of the greatest poems ever written. You may have heard the phrase, love is a many splendor thing, credited to Francis Thompson. It turns out Francis Thompson had his demons to fight as well. He spent three years on the streets of London, addicted to opium. His poem captured well God's relentless pursuit of the human soul, and it seems it was inspired by the poet's own life, running to stand still. Even though the speaker is aware of God's presence, he keeps running because he he believes giving into God means giving up worldly pleasures. As someone once said, even the man looking for pleasure in hiring a prostitute is actually looking for the fulfillment that can only come from God. Back to my pop culture class. A couple of weeks ago, as we watched together, well, actually in isolation, separately, alone together or something like that, the movie Risen. It's the story of a, uh, of a Roman military tribune named Clavius, who is essentially Pilate's right-hand ma man. He is tasked with confirming the death of Jesus and orders a soldier to pierce his side. The body is taken away by Joseph to be buried in his family's tomb. Mysteriously, the body of Jesus disappears and Clavius goes from being a war hero to becoming a detective in order to find Jesus's missing body. He interviews followers of this Yeshua, explores the forensic of burst ropes, looks for these missing guards, and investigates cover-up stories created by the Pharisees. Long story short, instead of finding a body, he finds Yeshua risen. But really, it is Jesus who has found Clavius. Clavius stops in his tracks, doesn't order an arrest. He's gobsmacked. He's witness to a miracle running to stand still. Sometimes we go looking for the wrong thing, but end up finding what we really needed. That's a good story, isn't it? The story of the hero we follow called Jesus. The irony of faith in Christ is that dying saves us. This day in the liturgical church is known as Monday Thursday. Sounds a bit like a Mennonite accent trying to say the word Monday, but it's Monday. It also celebrates a story that happens just prior to the crucifixion. Monday, Thursday, or Holy Thursday, is the day we remember Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and the celebration of the Last Supper. Monday is derived from the Latin word for command and references the call for Jesus' disciples to love one another as I have loved you. Interestingly, Holy or Monday, Thursday also commemorates Jesus' famous prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. This prayer happens just prior to his betrayal by his follower Judas. It also happens just after the Last Supper. Jesus seems to be overwhelmed and frustrated as his, at his disciples for not understanding what he was talking about, running to stand still. I ended up looking at Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane with my XL class last week, and I want to read it to you now. If your Bibles are handy, turn to Matthew 26, verses 36 to 39. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. There's three questions I want to explore with you in this passage. The first is this, where did Jesus pray and why? He went off by himself for prayer. Alone with God, Jesus could freely pour out his heart to the father knowing the Father understands the broken language of sighs and groans. 
this habit of going off to be alone with his father was something we see throughout the Gospels, something that I taught in spiritual formation class as well. It reminds you and me of David's habit of spending time with the Creator, and we have the gift of the Psalms as a result. And to lament, as David uh, demonstrates in the Psalms, uh, this is exactly what Jesus is, is doing here in this prayer. A second question is, what did Jesus ask in prayer? Jesus asked, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, verse 39. He was asking if he could avoid the suffering of the cross. But notice the way Jesus couched his request, if it is possible. He left the decision to the Father when he said this, yet not as I will, but as you will, verse 39. Although Jesus was keenly aware of the bitter suffering he was to undergo, he freely subjugated his desire to the Father. He based his own willingness upon the Father's will. And we see the same format in the Psalms in what we call lament. It's a sharing of suffering with God. And within these Psalms, we sense the same shift, a shift from a reliance on self to a reliance on God. And you've heard me say this before. I believe daily we need to confirm that God is indeed on the throne of our lives. The third question is this. What was the answer to Jesus to Jesus's prayer in the garden? God's answer was that his will, the will of the Father, would be done. The cup of suffering on the cross did not pass from Jesus. His prayer acknowledged his willingness to defer to his Father's will. And God answered that prayer and fortified him for the mission. An angel from heaven appears to him and strengthens him. Anyone else want an angel right now? We've got a long wait ahead of us. We don't even know how long running to stand still. Tomorrow we celebrate what we term Good Friday. I've always thought an odd way to describe this day. The actor and director Mel Gibson tried to capture this suffering through the film The Passion. Intense movie. But unlike in the movie, the story does not end in death. In fact, it is just the beginning. And we, like Clavius from the movie Risen, whether we realize it or not, may have not been looking for the right thing. You may have come to Bible college to have some questions answered. Maybe you came to buttress your theology and learn all about Jesus. But I hope instead he found you. Instead of simply finding evidence for historical Jesus, I hope you have found the risen Lord who desires a real living relationship with you. You see, theology doesn't save you. Relationship with the creator of the universe does. It is God's amazing grace and his pursuit of his bride that results in the salvation we celebrate this weekend. The love of Christ for us does not diminish. It only grows. So here are my final words for this chapel. Stop running. Turn. Embrace him. Stand still. Psalm 46's command is for us to be still. Stop running and know that I am God. The hound of heaven has hunted you down and there is no escape from the story. You are a part of the greatest story ever told. And the joy we have, to paraphrase the poet Walt Whitman, is that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for watching this chapel service. If you'd like to see a few others, you can click the subscribe button or the link to the other videos.